Good evening, good afternoon, welcome everybody. This is our April 2019 Community Conversation. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Dr. Takia Nur Amin. I'm the content director and member of the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism Organizing Collective Board. Normally, I would be facilitating our conversation this evening with Community Minister for Blue, the Reverend Michael Slack, who unfortunately is not feeling well. So we send him all kinds of prayers, healing thoughts, and good energy. Feel better soon, Michael. We love you. Um, uh, we are really excited this evening to be hosting a community conversation about a topic that has been bubbling up and generating a lot of consideration amongst Black UUs. This first became um, an issue that was raised to the awareness of those of us on the OCB at the 2017 Convening of Black Unitarian Universalists that we hosted in New Orleans. It became clear at that time that Lots of Black UUs wanted to have community conversations where we could dig deeper in a safe space around a set of topics. And one of those topics was this notion of sort of religious education and spiritual growth, um, particularly as it sits in our lives as Black UUs. The purpose of these um, community conversations is really to respond to a longing to go deeper among Black UUs about topics that we heard about at the convening. Um, it gives us an opportunity to continue shaping and articulating a Black UU theological framework on the road to the Harper Jordan Memorial Symposium that we're hosting this fall, which you'll hear a little bit more about at the end of our conversation. And it gives us an opportunity to really lean into our principles as people of a shared faith in this living tradition to discuss issues of relevance and pertinence to us. Again, thank you on behalf of the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce each of our special guests. So when I do that special guest, I will say your name and your fancy important title, and I would ask that you just unmute yourself and give greetings to those who are assembled here in the Zoom room, okay? First, I am pleased and proud to say that we have the Reverend Dr. Natalie Maxwell Fenimore, Minister of Lifespan Religious Education, the UU Congregation at Shelter Rock. She is the board VP at Star King School for the Ministry and a member of the UUA's Commission on Institutional Change. Hello, everybody. I shall also say that for me personally, um, um, Reverend Dr. Fenimore's name is one of the ones that I came across when I first entered Unitarian Universalism and was looking for uh, badass black women to learn more about. And I was pleased and proud to meet her and find out that she absolutely lived up to the definition of badass. So we're really, really lucky to have her here with us tonight. Thank you again. Our um, second guest is Aisha Hauser, Director of Lifelong Learning at East Shore Unitarian Universalist Church and a 2018 Angus McLean, McLean Award winner. Hi, everybody. So happy to be here. Want to say that Aisha has been a member of our Blue family since the very beginning. She is a co-conspirator. She is <laughs> um, a sister in this struggle with us, and we are pleased and proud to count her as a member of our Blue community. She's also been especially helpful to those of us on the Blue Organizing Collective Board whenever we've begun to think about the ways in which we can meet the needs of Black Unitarian Universalist youth and young adults. So thank you so much for being here, Aisha. Thank Last you. but absolutely not least is Jessica York, Director of Congregational Life. And Jessica will pretend like that's sort of a humble or small thing, but I was told shortly before we got on the call tonight that th she is the first ever religious educator to be in that role of Director of Congregational Life. So we salute you, we thank you, we're so glad that you're here. Jessica? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am I'm pleased to be here, and it's, it's nice to see some familiar names and faces uh, on the call with us and some new folks, too. 
Mm -hmm. It's really exciting because I look at the room count and it's about 15 of us who are here in the conversation. Surely others might join in, but it's really nice to kind of have these opportunities to gather even in virtual community to talk about issues that are important to us as Black UUs. Jessica, I'm actually going to come to you first, okay, around this question of, you know, one of the things that came up in the survey was lots of folks in our community want to know what is spiritual growth in Unitarian Universalism? And I think part of what that question comes from is a lot of Black UUUs may be coming from other faith traditions or spiritual communities where there were particular markers or milestones around spiritual growth and development. And they're looking for perhaps a similar pathway or way to understand that process here. So how do we talk about spiritual growth and Unitarian Universalism? Anything you wanna share with us? Thanks, Takia. So, you know, when I was uh, first entering the field of religious education, much of what I looked to in order to understand sort of the stages of faith and spiritual growth were uh, some ideas put forth by James Fowler. Some folks may be familiar with James Fowler's book, The Stages of Faith, and Fowler talks about uh, what some of those stages are. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is, is sort of the longer that I, that I worked in this field and the more I had encounter with different people, even though I could see that there's some, uh, some truth in those stages, and some of them have to do with just developmental stages of, of, uh, of human beings, right? And our thinking and our ability to have abstract thinking versus concrete thinking. And when we begin to differentiate, differentiate ourselves from others. And uh, for example, when a young person who maybe has been going to a UU congregation all their life uh, begins to question whether Unitarian Universalism is really real for them and something for them or just something that their you know, parents are trying to hand down to them and where they make that decision as to whether or not they're going to claim their faith as their own. That's certainly something that, uh, that I experienced with my own child who went through uh, a point. As a matter of fact, when she was uh, 18 and going through a bridging ceremony, at our congregation, the congregation where you know I, I had worked as the religious educator for many years, um, she was very proud to stand up in the pulpit and say that she did not identify as Unitarian Universalist. Um, at that point in time, it was really important for her to claim her identity as an atheist, and she was working through a lot of her theology. Um, and she, you know, I knew that she was working through this theology because of some of the foundation that she had received in our religious education uh, programs. And now, as a young adult, she does claim Unitarian Universalism, and, and she identifies as a Unitarian Universalist atheist, and she, she's been able to take those two concepts and see how those two concepts meld. So that's a piece of her own, you know, spiritual development. And so there's something in here about, for me, about the level of complexity. And uh, I've become less interested in trying to come up with a set definition for what spiritual development will look like to everybody and to try to help people distinguish what spiritual development may feel like for them. And, uh, you know, for me, it has felt like um, really being able to, to move from, a big piece of it has been to be able to move from um, either or thinking to both and thinking. As I have moved through the world, as I've encountered more people who have different ideas about theology and, and spirituality, um, you know, I've come to realize there's uh, no right and no wrong way necessarily in order to do that, in order to find those paths through the world, that we all kind of have to find those paths ourselves. And the experiences that we're going to have on those paths are going to vary and to me, the important thing is that uh, as you're having those experiences, you're taking them and you're processing them and, and you're reflecting on them. And that process and that reflection is leading to some learning. And that learning takes you to another step. And as long as you are taking in that information and reflecting on it and learning from it, I think it's gonna keep taking you to new places. I don't think it's, it's linear. That's a little bit of a problem when you have uh, like stages, right? People think of them as linear. 
I think of things as more of a spiral where you might have similar experiences and similar thoughts, but they may take you sort of back to the same place, but it may be deeper than when you first was in that place. So as long as you've still got some, some movement in terms of your beliefs and how you interact with and connect with others in the world, then I think you've got some spiritual growth. Thank you for that, Jessica. I really appreciate you bringing into the conversation the image of the spiral as we think about growth and development. Reverend Dr. Fenimore, I'm going to come to you now and see what you might share with us on this topic, thinking about, well, what is spiritual growth? How do we understand it in our shared living tradition? Well, I think, um, you know, going back to the blue principle that our spiritual growth uh, incorporates our embracing our wholeness. I find that that has great meaning for me that personally I'm drawn to this as um, a challenge um, to know and embrace my whole self and the wholeness of others um, is, a, is a very deep spiritual dimension, self-knowledge, self-definition, because it's very powerful. It's very enabling for you as an individual as well as for a community. I think that one of the strengths for Unitarian Universalism is the way that it can affirm the power of the individual. It's only in the points which we go so far into individualism that that becomes a negative. But uh, for me as a person who grew up in the African American Baptist tradition, my family's from the South, so that's like in me, like, you know, greens and cornbread and black, eye, it's in me. Um, that's why I, I physically move through worship with that, that kind of embodiment. However, uh, what was missing in that for me was a sense about who I was as an individual within that community. And there were times when I was asked to give up myself and be what this community was saying I should be or needed to be, or that we all needed to be. There was a sense that we were in lockstep in our spiritual growth and development and needed the same things because we were all black. And, and Unitarian Universalism is giving me an opportunity to claim that for myself as an individual. It also has given me the space to grow spiritually as a more accepting person. My ability to embrace people, other marginalized people, other people, who had lived in their own communities because they needed to for their self-protection, for their very life. So LGBTQ people, um, transgender people, accepting them, embracing them as my spiritual family, that I got in Unitarian Universalism. That was not coming to me from the Baptist church or from the black community that I was in. I know that it is in some places, but it wasn't for me. That I found in Unitarian Universalism. That was just a spiritual growth edge for me there. I also think though, um, as a professional, as a religious leader, that I'm called to ask myself and others to answer the question about whether it is at all possible to grow spiritually without the journey to embrace the whole self. Okay. Um, I think that religious leadership asks of a faith development leader, whether they're a teacher, preacher, or pastoral presence, to ask that question of the people and to build community space for reflection on the possibility of this level of self-awareness and self-growth as a spiritual dimension. You know, what we tend to do um, in Unitarian Universalism is, is to overemphasize the individual personal spiritual growth as, you know, aspect of spiritual growth. It's true that all spiritual growth is personal, it is individual, but we often discount the context in which it is built, right? A religious institution or a community can build a structure that leads you toward particular expectations, creeds, assumptions, history, traditions, principles around your individual personal spiritual growth. So you're not going to look in certain directions. You're not going to try certain things if you're in a box that's telling you that those are the wrong things to do, that that's a bad thing to do. 
Okay, so one of the gifts of Unitarian Universalism can be for some people to open those boxes, some of those boxes. But I think we should acknowledge that culturally, historically, Unitarian Universalism does have a box, right? That we have an individualistic, um, white, middle-class, het heteronormative, you know, hierarchical, white male centered box, right? That is pushing our ideas about what spiritual development might be for us, what spiritual growth might be for us. So we tend to learn it in our faith development uh, structure by the typical way that we learn history or any kind of development out in the outside world, which is a great white man theory, right? So these are the names that we know you know, you need to know Emerson, you need to know Thoreau, right? Maybe a couple of white women, maybe, but not, but that's how you have to, to learn to be a Unitarian Universalist, uh, sort of in a general way, not everybody, but that's our norm. And when you've learned those markers and understand the messages of those people, then you can feel like you have developed as a Unitarian Universalist. But like the rest of the world, you can learn a lot about just a very narrow range of your faith and be considered having grown in the faith, having been developed in the faith, because you're in that context, right? But I was recently reading um, James Cone's last book, Wasn't Gonna Tell Nobody, where he talks about his journey from being a, um, a theologian um, PhD, very fluent in Eurocentric theology, and having to unlearn, unpack that, having to say, I know that, but I'm not whole as a theologian. I can't preach or teach or write about a black theology without immersing myself in that history and culture and understanding the theological mandates the spiritual growth that comes out of that tradition right that he could use the skills of research of writing of rhetoric of argument that he learned in his phd study but he had to use a different context he had to do that to move forward and i think that that is what i'm hoping we can build as a sign of spiritual growth for us as black Unitarian Universalists, is that we can use the tools of, um, of reflection, of critical reflection. We can understand this, you know, the history of religion. We can understand faith development uh, you know, steps. But we can incorporate that into a greater, our cultural context. You know, our spiritual development, our learning about our whole selves, our learning about our whole history in Unitarian Universalist, our um, using black leaders in Unitarian Universalism as our markers, our incorporating their lessons as our markers towards spiritual growth. I think that if that we can develop that as a way of understanding the deepening of the Black Unitarian Universalist um, spiritual leadership. And that is going to require more people of color in uh, positions of leadership in Unitarian Universalism, an unlearning of our preference as Unitarian Universalists for white male leadership. Really understanding that that, that you know, we're putting up faces we're building a narrative. And there's a, there's a theology that you are supporting with that narrative and with those images. And so we need to have um, more variety in who we see in leadership so that we can see those, those examples of spiritual development and growth in our movement. Thank you for bringing all of that into the room. I just wanna lift up two things that you said that I would encourage us to hold on to. One is, you know, it was really great to have 
Blue's third principle, spiritual growth is directly tied to our ability to embrace our whole selves really centered in this conversation because that principle is about an affirmation of wholeness, right? Um, one of the things that I know went into the thinking of developing that principle is that when we look at black religious experience across traditions, you know, regardless of what the particular religious contours are, that generally speaking, um, black folks go where we feel free, full, whole, and affirmed. In, in, in our humanity and, and in our expression. Um, it also makes me think about how one of the challenges to Blue has been people on the outside of it saying, oh, well, it must be so boring when you all are together because, you know, I mean, it's just Black. Not understanding that Blackness is always already diverse and nuanced and complex that we are not only not a monolith, but a tapestry of a full spectrum of experiences and perspectives and ways of being in the world. And that there's a richness in that, that at least you know, we're suggesting can be central as we continue learning about ourselves and developing spiritually in this tradition, that we don't have to take the complexity and the history and the fullness of who we are as black people and somehow set that aside so that we can embrace Emerson or Thoreau and that we don't have to look for, you know, who's the black Emerson, you know, someone asked, you know, who's the black, that we don't have to look for analogous thinkers, but that the truth of our spiritual growth and development, maybe as black you use, is at least in part evidenced in the lives of black people in this tradition. And that if we learn to look at that living expression of our faith, we might see markers around spiritual growth. Aisha, I'm coming to you. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do. I, I'm, I'm blown away at the dull white person who's projecting their own uh, dullness onto black people. Sorry, I needed to say that because the idea that... Um, so so I, the, what is spiritual growth in Unitarian Universalism? And I'm going to answer that in general first, because for me, as soon as I, I read that, our blessing is our curse. So it's great. It's, I, I grew up strict Muslim, right? So I fasted from when I was 11, told what to do, similar to Nally's experience, and it wasn't about my individual needs at all. So when I walk into a UU congregation, the first one I actually walked into when I was 20, and, and they gave me a little spring potpourri, and then I didn't go back till I was 36 or 37. Um, and the blessing is like, oh, hey, welcome, stained glass dinosaurs. You can believe what you want about God or not God. We're humanists. That's, that was a, you know, kind of mind expanding, beautiful, right? The curse part is um, whether or not, there's no mandate that that happen in community, really. There, there's the invitation. You could be in covenant or you can't be, or, you know, we want you to be in covenant. And then when you break the covenant, then what happens? So the, the, there's a richness that can be there when we are, when um, we hold true to who we say we are, because I think we're pretty cool on paper and then humans get in the way and then it gets um, uh, watered down and um, white centered. I mean, the idea of asking who a black Emerson is, is, is real bizarre and look who it centers. Why are we centering Emerson? Because somebody, you know, um, so we invite folks on a spiritual journey. Then we argue what the word spirituality even means in white spaces. And then um, for youth, we have coming of age at about eighth grade. Basically, when I asked about that, they were like, oh, because there's confirmation and bar and bat mitzvahs. Not really because it makes sense for our youth who weren't really giving a huge job to. We need the adults to go through coming of age and to go through classes and think about who they are and how they connect to themselves. And the notion of connecting and embracing our whole selves is so different based on how we've been socialized, who we are. Um, my, I was born in Egypt. My father's also from Sudan. And so I have internalized colonialism in addition to, so I've had to learn to embrace and love my hair um, my family would always tell me to straighten my hair because it was messy. And I'm like, it's curly. So part of my spiritual growth within Unitarian Universalism is affirming myself that I'm loved and I, and I love others, right? We, we, this is how I internalize Unitarian Universalism. We are come from one source and we are all worthy of love. Now, what it, how do we grow? 
I, I want to grow in relationship and I find that when I am um, held accountable in relationship for how I am living out my values and spirituality in different contexts, uh, that has served me well. And, and I've attempted to do this in the, whether it's in liberal religious educators association, Lareda or in blue or in, in the uh, programs where I am the leader. This is the third church I'm at. Um, and, and because we don't, again, our blessing is our curse. It's great that we have, we offer so much. And I, I actually learned from Jessica many, many years ago, she said to me, you use don't teach what to think, but how to think. So I've held on to that nugget my whole life since I heard it from you, Jessica. And we also, I think, don't hold each other enough accountable in our spiritual growth to con because the to affirm each other fully in who we say we are. And that includes, I agree with um now that well, I agree with everything, everything was everybody said. Um and what does it look like when how do we, here's the thing that I've been struggling, struggling with in real time. We embrace, I, I want to, and I, I strive to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. But when so, we have somebody recently who came to East Shore who is espousing basically just short of white nationalist ideas, like, okay, so how, how do, how do I spiritually still affirm this person and put boundaries on what they say? And that's been a challenge for me, but I think Blue has been a gift in both the embracing of each other and myself and then of, of holding the community. Thank you so much for that. What I um, really appreciate is something that I'm hearing, which is for spiritual growth to happen, we need structures of both support and accountability. You know, sort of that in order to move through our development as whole people, it's not enough to just be sort of an individual by yourself on Walden Pond, <laughs> you know, doing it all on your own. It's not to suggest that there isn't value in solitude, but perhaps a Black Unitarian Universalist ethic, which centers a more communitarian approach to um, our faith life, requires that we both hold each other accountable and our free and you know free disciplined and responsible in our search for truth and meaning as we move through our lives as unitarian universalists that it's not either or you know to gesture back to something jessica said it's both and it's both a personal responsibility to foster one spiritual growth but also a community responsibility to create structures or containers as i like to think of them that can hold people as they grow and struggle and wrestle, um, you know, in my own career as an educator, I never really thought of myself as the person that had all the information in the room, but more so as someone who had the skill of creating spaces that allowed other people to think and explore and engage critical reflection and make mistakes, right? Or to um, not even mistakes, but just to explore and engage and consider all of the possibilities that are present and that that was enough. You know, it wasn't about kind of screwing people's heads off and dumping knowledge in. <laughs> it was much more about creating spaces that were structured enough to hold people lovingly as they move through their growth. It also makes me think about this notion of spiritual or spirituality. You know, you use, we love to wordsmith and argue about definitions. But it makes me think of spirituality as just an acknowledgement that there is something to us beyond our material reality. That there's something about who I am, who each of us is, that has worth and dignity and value beyond just what you see in front of you. You know, and to encourage people to embrace that in themselves and each other. Reverend Dr. Natalie, I see you thinking. Did yeah. you have something else you wanted to share? Well, I wanted to say, you know, um, um, I've done a, my studies in narrative theology, sort of the stories that we tell and how those stories help us um, create and live into our theology. So you're talking about Thoreau. If you go to Walden, 
and you see the model of the cabin, you'll see that he put a chair there for a guest, right? So the story is already not the story that we are told and that we know, right? So the question is often then, why is the story being repeated a particular way and told a particular way when it could be told another way, right? This was not a man who's, um, who was completely separate from the world when he was in his cabin, because he was walking to town. Everybody from town could walk to him. It was a wood lot. People were coming there all the time to cut trees and fish, and he had a chair for them to come sit down. His mom was bringing his laundry, right? His sister was making his meals. So how we tell this, it isn't the story itself, actually. It's the choices that we make to tell those stories. So we tell the Unitarian Universalist story and don't put the black people in it. It's not that they weren't there. It's the choices we make about how to tell the story, which parts of the story we lift up and which we don't. And those are the questions I think that we have to ask when we're considering what kind of Unitarian Universalism we wanna build, right? And then the question of containers. I love that because I like to think of that, you know, worship is a container for ex an experience. It's not the experience. It's a container for the experience. So our, at our best, our religious education programs are containers for experience, containers for learning, but they are not learning or experience. They are containers for, that we build to try to guide people toward a particular, um, a particular encounter right, um, a possibility, and that that possibility changes all the time depending on the, the construction of that container or the people involved in that container, that it's always changing, and we're just trying to hold it very gently without actually, we're, without actually being the ones who decide what the shape is, right, in the end, we're just holding it. So, these ideas, I think, about um, how blue and black who use go forward with the narrative material that we have is about us claiming the power and the responsibility for shaping that narrative of what the future of Unitarian Universalism is going to be, you know. I tend to say that the current Unitarian Universalism is not what I'm in love with, but the possibility and the future. And that's our, you know, I think this is a moment where people aren't saying that it isn't going to be given to you, you know, as they say, you know, the, the master's tools will not be used <laughs> to take down the master's house. What are our tools to build the future of Black Unitarian Universalism? And how can the faith development structures, what, is, what has been learned in faith development, be used to forge those new tools, to forge that new Unitarian Universalism? Because I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of good things that we have done and explored you know, um, both Asia and Jessica, very active in building the faith development office at the UUA in building the tools that can be used to expand a vision of Unitarian Universalist future. And how will that go forward, you know, to build the kind of uh, faith development, spiritual growth community that we want that's more attentive to the needs, particular needs, of black people, you know, how that goes forward, I think is the responsibility for a larger group of people, you know, for everybody to take on their part of that. And, um, and, and use the narrative that we have in some different ways. I appreciate you for bringing that into the room. It just reminds me that there's a difference between all are welcome and this was created with you in mind. Right. So I know for me, when I was teaching, one of the things I would do at the beginning of a course is I would do these little surveys with my students to get more information about who they were. 
Because even if the course didn't change from semester to semester, the students were always different, right? So how was I going to facilitate a space to hold those, those people that I was learning with if I didn't have some understanding of who they were beyond their names on a, on a roll, right? The distinction between all are welcome versus this was made for you or let's make this together feels um, kind of especially relevant here. It also just makes me think about my grandparents who, you know, my grandfather had a third grade education and was still going to Sunday school in his 80s. You know, my grandmother had an eighth grade education and still went to Sunday school. You know, there was this idea that some kind of commitment to learning or the community of the Sunday school was important or necessary or valuable along their journey to um, grow or I don't even you know want to necessarily say mature as much as I want to say deepen within their within their spiritual tradition and so I'm wondering um, Reverend Natalie I want to stay with you for a minute how do we foster that kind of spiritual growth deepening amongst ourselves as black you use and how do we know when we're doing it you know what kinds of markers might we see that indicate a deepening or that delineate that spiritual growth is happening well i think um i've been particularly interested in a couple of and how we can adopt a couple of practices from the african-american um theological education tradition into Unitarian Universalism. One of those is um, mentoring in deacons and elders, having lay people who feel a responsibility to pass on, right? And I don't know, we just, uh, you just seem to have jumped over that. I, so I think we need to pull that back and think about that and how we can use that. I I'm sorry that, to jump in, but isn't that kind of strange? And you're right about that, that we kind of, pat, we, the tradition seems to have sort of fast forwarded past thinking past really about the training of the laity in that yes. way. Yes, and I think it's been, you know, you can see how it has caused some real problems in our organizational structure, not having that. And it also, I think, um, it, it enables that deepening because you have a personal relationship, you're passing on personal history, you're connecting people in a, in a very um, personal way. I think we have it a little more so with some of our youth and the coming of age kids who get mentors, but our adults just don't seem to want to do that. And I think that's probably a white supremacy culture thing, you know, that they, you know, people have to admit that they are not the, the expert and turn to someone and, and let them, and, and um, elders have to say that part of my legacy is in you, right? And that's really, it seems to be hard for our people. The other thing that I've been studying is story linking, which is um, uh, Beverly Wimberly has written about this, and it's a way of, um, in traditional Christian African-American, um, denominations, you take a story from the Bible and you link it with a contemporary issue and you talk about those two narratives as a way of coming to an understanding, a faith-based understanding about how to reach uh, out into the future, how to go forward, right? So, um, in a I've used this a little bit in a conversation about, um, there was an article in the UU World about why people would have multi-faith experiences, right? So if you look in a Unitarian Universalist history to um, Frances Harper, who had multi-faith experiences, she chose to stay in the AME and the Unitarian. Why would you do that? What's that about? So that's an example of using sort of a non-biblical story but a story based in African-American narrative and Unitarian Universalism to have a conversation about a contemporary issue and how, to, how relying on her experience can help you to move forward. So you link your stories in order to go forward. 
and that deepens your understanding about who you are as a black African American Unitarian with someone else who in the past who's had that experience and then to go forward with them. So I think we can use tech, find and use techniques like those and create some indigenously in African American Unitarian Universalism that would be markers for deepening of faith. That's really helpful. Um, I really love the idea of story linking, especially because one of the things that seems to be bubbling up as a part of this Black UU theology that we are co-creating together as a community is both, is an equitable embrace of UU principles and sources, and sources, not principles or sources. So there seems to be, at least in the blue community, a strong desire to mine the sources of our faith, including wisdom traditions and scripture for what is useful on our journey towards love and justice. So that's, that's really helpful. Aisha, I'm coming to you thinking again about this question of, you know, how do we facilitate and foster that deepening amongst ourselves as Black UUs? So, <clears throat> so I, I've, I've been active or at least paying attention to what goes on uh, in on the blue Facebook page. And I say that because it's, it's a pretty active page and, and for um, many folks who are on it, it is their spiritual, it is our spiritual community, right? And when I was thinking about this question about how to foster spiritual growth, so one is centering definitely, and I thank you, Natalie, for the story linkages and Jessica had written in the chat, um, Reverend Barber does do story linkages really well. That's one way. The other way I think that I would love to invite into this space is um, repair and restoration. So the blessing of social media is that I can connect with people pretty regularly and I actually get to know people online and then I meet them in person and I'm like, oh, I actually know some things about you. How are your children? How are, how is your life? And I heard about this or that. Um, then when there's a, a I'm going to say break, but that's for lack of a better word, the tension, um, a, a, a break in covenant, uh, there's hurt feelings. And then what I, what I, and I want to do this in, in brick and mortar and um, spaces, including social media, but in our spaces is how do we invite restoration? How do we say, okay, there was, um, I'm being very concrete, hurt feelings about something said or somebody thinks or a disagreement. So how do we come back together and practice grace and practice restoring what was broken because we're not a large community. Um, we are strong. Everything's fine until it's not. And then how do we come back from the not fine? And that's something that speaks really, really strongly to me because I think that's part of what's been heartbreaking about um, when I hear, sometimes I hear, um, and especially from other Black UUs who hear mythology about Blue, who maybe have never been on the Facebook page or like, um, or have been on it, had hurt feelings, left, never came back. And then I'm like, well, actually, the story you're holding on to or you're telling yourself or you heard from some such is not complete. And we need to have grace with each other because uh, there is an opportunity here to develop wholeness or to become whole. And I, and I think we need that's a part of it because... One of the things that we know how to do well is sit in discomfort, work through trauma, come out the other end, because that's part of not living in a, living in a body that is not white and part of the dominant culture in the society, is that we've had to do this early um, in our lives for various reasons and in various settings. And so um, how do we have grace with each other and affirm Unitarian Universe that we are a UU community that's connected to each other? even after tension and conflict. What I really appreciate about that, Aisha, is, you know, I'm hearing two things in your comments and in Natalie's foregoing comments. The idea of story linking, um, to me, all, it suggests something very powerful and empowering about reading ourselves back into 
a history and ongoing narrative that has marginalized or erased black folks from it, right? Not just for the purpose of correcting history, but as a way of understanding um, how to live both into and through this faith tradition, this living tradition. But also these practices of, you know, restoring, you know, restoration, repair as central practices to hold us in community, especially as we navigate um, some of the shame and trauma that people bring into the space as a result of living in a white supremacist world. I mean, that, that's just real. Um, we, some of us move through the world with a lot on us that we are um, trying to move through and trying to live into wholeness. And so those practices of repair and having grace with each other, that's not the same thing as saying everything goes or anything goes, right? All behaviors are acceptable, but it is a way of saying we want you to be returned to wholeness. We want you to be affirmed. We want you to be as well as you can be. We want you to thrive. And so we cultivate practices that encourage that embrace of community and wholeness. That's really, this is very exciting. Jessica, what thoughts do you have? And let me just say, I'm so glad that the three of you are here with us. So thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my, my thoughts are going all over the place. I mean, when you were talking about story, one of the things that, uh, so I, I'm quite a lover of stories too, and I love to tell stories. And, uh, and I love to find out new things. And so, uh, you know, biology is one of the fields I'm very interested in, and in particular, like brain science. So I find it just um, too intriguing the way our brain processes uh, stories and the fact that the stories that we hear, like, you know, fairy tales or the story of, of the role, all the ways those stories come to us, um, stories about other people's lives get uh, stacked in the same place in the brain as the stories of our own lives. And so on some level, our brain isn't able to tell the difference between those stories and so the stories that you hear also become your stories too. And so it's really important, right? The stories we tell ourselves because that stuff goes into our brain and it's not just stored in some place as, okay, here's a story and that story may be fictional and this story may be non-fictional. No, they're all in there together. And all of those are, are knowledge or information that we're going to draw on as we go through our lives. So it is it's extremely important that we tell stories that, um, that are going to help keep us healthy and whole. And, um, you know, one of the words that comes to my mind when we're talking about spiritual growth and um, how can we, you know, foster that amongst ourselves is, uh, is about transformation. And I was just sitting here thinking about what is sometimes difficult for me uh, about going into a, a UU space is that I don't always feel like the people who are sitting beside me in the pew are there for the kind of transformation that I'm there for. You know, um, people were talking, uh, you know, you were talking about your grandma and your grandfather and, and the uh, going to Bible class. And so I've got a brother who's a Baptist minister. And, uh, you know, when I'm up there in Atlantic City where he is, I, I go to his church and um, and I go to their Bible class, and uh, I know those people are there looking for some transformation. And so it's, it's a little, it's, um, it's again more of that, you know, both and, because saying that I'm looking for some transformation in myself, and it's not the same as saying I don't think I'm whole, right? Uh, that, I, that I think that something is wrong with me or that I need fixing. Uh, it's, it's simply an acknowledgement of the fact that, uh, that I feel that I am capable of changing and growing and incorporating those new experiences that I spoke of earlier. But one piece I didn't talk about earlier when I talk about incorporating those new experiences was to talk about the practice of them. Um, because that's part of the spiral too, right? You have, you have some kind of action and, uh, and you, you reflect on it and you learn something from it, but then you've got to use that information, right? I mean, sitting with that information all by itself doesn't do you any good. Uh, you've got to go out and you've got to use it. You've got to practice it. As long as it's sitting in your head, 
you don't even know whether it's, it's right or wrong, right? Whether it's going to work for you out in the world, whether it, it really is encapsulating the values that you want to live out in the world. You don't know that until you go out and you actually practice it with people. So uh, I love the fact that there's so much talk about community because to me, it all comes back to community. And if you're not living those values out in community, they are absolutely worthless. <laughs> and I've started to think of, so I was at a conference, an interfaith conference, and um, someone at the conference put forward the idea of instead of talking about the interfaith movement, uh, what if we talked about the interfaith community? Because they said movements have beginning and endings, and movements have very specific goals, and that's not what the interfaith community really is. And while I was sitting there, I was like, huh, well, you know, we went through a period, you know, some years back where we talked about Unitarian Universalism as a movement, and some people still do talk about it as a movement, but what would it be like if we talked about Unitarian Universalism as a community of people? And as we've explored, you know, Unitarian Universalism outside of brick and mortar spaces, uh, we have started to understand more about um, the communal focus of Unitarian Universalism. And I think as we start to center more of the experiences of people of color, we're just going to come to understand all the more how really it has to do with community, because community has been what has saved us all along, right? We, uh, you know, we wouldn't be here now without that. When I walk in, uh, in Birmingham, uh, just off of downtown, I have some of my elders tell me about how this used to be uh, a really vibrant African-American community where we took care of ourselves, where we had our own doctors. And I remember my doctor was down there in one of those, in the Masonic Temple building on 4th Avenue, uh, how we had our own stores, our own restaurants, and we took care of ourselves. And then so much of that got lost during integration. Um, which is a shame, and many people are trying to recover that. You know, I see blue as a space where there's that community that's provided. It's a little ironic, I find it, that people were talking about it being boring because there's nothing but black people here. So the, part of the irony for that in me is that years ago, as I was trying to find a way just as an individual and as a um, at the time I was the uh, youth programs director at the UUA, I was trying to find a way to, uh, to provide some faith development material for and by people of color. And what I was hearing from people when I surveyed them was that what they wanted most of all was they, they wanted community. They wanted the chance to be together. So I started some, some Zoom calls, well, they were any meeting in the beginning, but then they became Zoom uh, calls for what I call the virtual community of color. And when I started that community, I had uh, quite a few people, people of color, who questioned, well, how can we be in community because we're all so different? I'm like, okay, now what is it? You know what? We can't be a good, strong community because we're all the same, but we also can't be a good, strong community because we're all so different. I mean, people will come up with something, you know, to make you begin to, to doubt yourself um, because we're still so, uh, so afraid in so many ways. I think that there's a deep, Fear within Unitarian Universalism that our center isn't strong enough to hold. And that's why people are afraid of us caucusing and us going off and, you know, having separate conversations and, um, and so afraid of conflict when it arises in our congregations too. So uh, one of the things that I hope the Blue community can provide, which is why I do love this third principle about spiritual growth being directly tied to our ability to embrace our whole selves, is that it's not always easy to embrace our whole selves. And there's a lot of people for whom it's harder than other people to do that. And some of the moments that are most striking to me that I can remember in the last few years of communities of color or black communities coming together is someone who has been a member of that community who is maybe really having some struggle around embracing their whole selves. And, and the ways that we can hold those individuals. I think that's probably still a question for me in my mind about, you know, how, how do we hold individuals who are really struggling to embrace their whole selves? How do we, um, how do we help them feel more um, empowered to do that? Um, how do we deal with 
what may be a fear around doing that or, um, you know, some people have just lived so long with all those messages, of course, saying that, that you can't, right? Uh, Asia and the curly hair, you know, you got to do something about your hair. I heard those messages about you got to do something about your hair too. And I did finally do something about my hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't what some of them thought it was going to be. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, but, but, but when I walk down the street and I see um, so many black people and so many different black hairstyles, right? And I can remember there was a time, I'm going to be frank, there was a time in my life when I, when I started to go natural with my hair that I saw people and they didn't have natural hair. And I was like, Oh, you know, why they feel like they still got to straighten their hair? Well, of course, that was about me, right? That wasn't really about them. It was about me uh, until I had a point where, uh, where I could realize that, that it was about me and that it wasn't about them and that we all have different choices to make in the world. And then I don't know that individual story and why they made that choice. So uh, several years ago, I decided to, I'm a real introvert. And uh, I'm fine with like public speaking and getting up with a whole room full of people. I can get up in an auditorium and speak and that's no problem. But you, you throw me in a small room with like a party of like 50 people or something and then the introvert really comes out. Um, but I decided to try the spiritual practice of talking to strangers more, doing a sort of, a, you know, radical welcoming. And I started to practice this primarily on um, modes of public transportation. Because I was taking, I'm, I'm a non-driver, and I was taking a lot of public transportation. So it was on buses, it was on airplanes, because I was flying a lot for work. Uh, it was in Ubers. And I just started talking to people. And I started to realize how uh, everybody is really interesting. Uh, everyone has some great stories to tell. And, and for me, that has evolved into some spiritual growth as I've been able to let go of some of what might have been judgmental thoughts on my mind earlier and to really free up my own mind. There's something in that spiritual growth, I think, that has to do with liberation and freedom, too. And, uh, and I'll stop there because I know we want to have time also for, for other folks to join this conversation. Well, I really appreciate you bringing in the language of transformation because one of the things that, you know, as Boo has traveled a little bit and done panels and workshops and things at different congregations, um, when we brought up that word, it has brought really interesting responses. You know, we had a, 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 a white gentleman, you know, I don't come to church to be transformed. You know, I'm not here to be transformed. It's like, so your goal in being here is to leave exactly as you were when you came, <laughs> you know. And, and it, it's sort of funny, but it's like transformation is radical and can be scary in the sense that it requires some faith. You know, I'm thinking about that old Forrest Gump quote, you know, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You know, the idea of opening oneself up to the possibility for transformation in some ways means you don't know exactly who you're going to be on the other side of that experience. You don't know who you're going to be on the other side of yielding to um, being present in community. You don't know who you're going to be when you start to think critically and reflect on um, the stories that might be shared or that you're introduced to and how they relate to your own story. You know, it's a, it's a willingness to be open to the possibility of, of who and what you might be and what we might be on the other side of that, which I think, um, is on the one hand really exciting, and on the other hand can be sort of terrifying for people, especially if they've had experiences in community that haven't always been mm, affirming or supportive, you know, or where they haven't necessarily always felt held. I see you thinking, yeah, Reverend Dr. Natalie. I say, you know, I want to, I guess I think a little differently about that in our community. The fear is that um, you have and are affirmed and supported in the community that we have. The majority of people in our congregations, the white members of our congregations, are in a community in the congregation or the greater UU movement, they're just fine with it, the way it's organized. I mean, it may not play out for them well 
individually from this moment to that. They have conflicts with people. They don't like this and that. They get mad and, you know, take my money, take my, my chair, I'm out of here. You know, people do that like on an individual basis. But the way we're set up institutionally affirms, affirms them. It's a happy place. So you are asking people to let go of a known positive for an unknown, perhaps not as positive. Not as, it's not a transform Unitarian Universalism that decenters whiteness, decenters whiteness, right? <laughs> There's a lot, I think we have to be clear and are often not clear about the benefits to our system staying exactly the way it is for a lot of people. And unless we can talk honestly about what they are, what they have to prepare themselves to give up, because it is the faithful thing to do, right? Then if we can't have that conversation, I don't think we can ever get to the point where there is going to be a change. Because there, because not having that conversation allows people actually not to grow spiritually, not to deepen, to stay on the top and float and wait until this is over and you all go home. It creates the possibility <laughs> of, you know, re-envisioning a community that maybe isn't, you know, great for some folks and oppressive for others, but that or is, yeah, good for all of, maybe it's not totally perfect for you all the time, but it's good for all of us, you know, um, really living. But, but exploring with people what great for them means, right? That we will, if we continue to allow the definition of great for you, meaning that you get to dominate other people, then we are failing in giving them some sort of um, spiritual grounding, some sort of, of deepened spiritual experience. We're allowing a definition that is outside of a faith definition to be present in our communities of faith. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, Natalie, I think there's another piece, too, though, that we have to be willing to engage with. And that is that there's going to be some people in our congregation who even when we, uh, you know, explain what they have to gain from decentering whiteness and moving towards dismantling white supremacy, they're not going to be on board with that, right? Because they're not ready to move over. And they're never going to be ready to move over, even if we say it's the faithful thing. So, you know, I would question whether those people really should call themselves Unitarian Universalists. And if our congregations and our UU communities are really going to try to do this work, we've got to be ready to let those people go. Um, I'm going to do a few brief announcements, then go to my guests for final wrap-up thoughts. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, the previous community conversations that we held for February and March are on Blue's YouTube channel. So if you miss those, you can go back, you can play them at your leisure, take notes, anything you want to do, as well as the Who's Faith in Is It Anyway panel that we hosted in January live on Facebook. You can also find that on YouTube. Um, we want to make sure that you have it in your calendar to be with us for the next community conversation, which will be Wednesday, May 29th at 7.30 p.m. It's wrapped around the fourth blue principle, which is experimentation and innovation must be built into our work. And that day we're actually going to be with Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers, Reverend Brandon Rencher, and Crystal Cheatham. And we'll be talking about innovative models for ministry and for doing spiritual community. How can we learn from other folks or even other traditions that are engaging innovative models for ministry? where resources are available so that we can continue meeting the needs of Black UUs. Want to encourage everybody to join us for that. Also, if you have not yet marked your calendar to be with us, October 30th to November 2nd in St. Paul, Minnesota, we will be hosting the first ever Harper Jordan Memorial Symposium proclaiming a Black UU theology. Registration is now open. Please do not allow any issues you might have around cost to bar you from being there. Indicate on the registration form if or what kind of support you might need so that we can um, be there for you and assist with that if those resources are necessary in any way. All of the information around registration and accommodations, you can make hotel reservations, as well as the draft of the schedule. 
um, is available on Blue's website. Really want folks to know that this will be a four day gathering that will include interactive plenary sessions on Thursday and Friday, spiritual grounding and worship. We're very excited that on Saturday, we will be hosting live a Black UU worship. And if you've never had a chance to worship live with Blue, um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for an amazing experience. This event is open to non-Black folks as well. So we know people in our Blue family have family members or spouses or um, others in their life who don't identify as Black. They are welcome to register and attend the event. However, we are prioritizing registration for Black POC and Indigenous people. So we are monitoring the list to make sure that that will be distributed equitably. But if you know other people who are interested in coming, encourage them to go ahead and register as well. Again, all that information can be found on our website at www.blacklivesuu.com. Again, I want to thank you all for being with us. This was rich and enlightening. I can't wait to go back and watch it again with my little notebook because, you know, before we started, I, I asked the guests to make sure that they were their authentic selves and y'all definitely brought some heat this evening. So thank you so much for being the badasses that I knew you would be. Reverend Dr. Natalie, I'm coming to you first for any closing remarks. Well, I think, um, I guess I want to just affirm our discussion about um, our spiritual actions, you know, that they matter, that um, our claiming our whole selves is a spiritual act, and it's a battle. You know, it's a spiritual battle. It's, uh, it's difficult, complex work, but it, for it to be authentic to us as Black Unitarian Universalists, it has to be grounded in Black history, in Black culture, in Black tradition that comes from a multitude of religious sources and spiritual sources. But as you said, the complexity of who we are has to be represented in this struggle to claim our wholeness within our religious communities. So I think that it's also, I think, a, something that we should celebrate. I find that um, that's an element that I believe that our um, Black religious tradition brings into Unitarian Universalism, something that is often lost is the actual ability to celebrate, you know, the actual ability to be grateful and appreciative, you know. There's a Lucille Clifton poem that I like where she says, uh, you know, I want to celebrate, you know, that every day of my life, something has tried to kill me and it has not succeeded, right? <laughs> praise, <laughs> praise, praise. So I think that spiritual growth um, and our learning to be who we are as people of faith, our, both our faith identity and our individual and cultural identities can be meshed together in a way that's affirmative and celebratory and adds richness to Unitarian Universalism and that that is our place of creative possibility. And that spiritual growth lies in those possibilities. And I, I um, don't know who said this to me, but I was told once that you know, part of ministry, perhaps the greatest part of ministry, is that you bring before the people their possibility. Thank you for that. Oh. I'm really holding on to that. Jessica, coming to you, any final thoughts you want to share? I'm just grateful for all these spirits and bodies that joined us during this conversation tonight. You know, we've had some talk about, about spirits and are there, and do we have one of those in our bodies and how those things interact and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm always amazed at how being a, a spirit in a body plays out in my life. So uh, I want to encourage folks to, you know, keep having the conversation. That's the important piece. And uh, not worry so much about, um, you know, monitoring yourself and, uh, and if you're right and, and if you're wrong and getting, you know, too much down in the weeds. But just realizing that having those interactions with each other and having those conversations with each other and being able to hold each other's truths and to find people who are also willing to hear your truths 
prize those. I mean, those are, those are special moments and special places and special people. And I hope everyone has some of those in their lives. Uh, I hope that they can find that within the Blue community also. Thank you for that. Thank you. Aisha, coming to you, closing remarks to share with our community. Um, yes to everything everyone said. I always love being with Jessica and Natalie and Takia and everyone who I know. I'm so grateful for how many people I know who were who here this evening. So thank you. And I do want to stress that in what is so powerful is our spiritual growth with belonging and we belong to each other. And I think that is so powerful in this new co-created faith uh, that is blue. So I really appreciate that. So, and, and I'm super honored to be invited. Thank you. Well, this was amazing. Thank you again, everybody for showing up and being with us in what I believe to be, you know, a sacred space that we created to engage some really serious and very, very deep topics. I'm going to unmute everybody so everybody can say goodbye and then I will end the call. Okay, everybody's unmuted. Say goodnight. <laughs> Bye. Say goodnight. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Appreciate everybody for being here. Good night. Good night.